we are live. What's good, people? It's your man, D.L. Saint. And this is the D.L. Saint I Really Want to Know podcast. Back with you, as promised. We are um, going to keep the history vibe going. Earlier, we, we were on today. We were talking about um, the richest man in the world, uh, Masa Musa. And we're also talking about uh, General the man old in the world. Day, uh, Benjamin O. Davis. Uh, and uh having a good time with that and today we're going to be you know this time around we're going to be talking about world war ii um we have uh brother franco on board with us man there's someone i met through the fresh and fit world um and, and before i get started man that's one of the things that people don't understand about what's going on with youtube and these different content creators and the platforms that they build and and these um you know these these uh network opportunities that that people are making and it's not just like fresh and fit but rollo tomasi uh you know the joker out there with better bachelors uh rich cooper you know even on the blue pill side you got people who are doing this thing you know they're setting up locals they're doing all this stuff bringing people together and letting folks share ideas and actually grow and build things together and that's what's going on here so i just wanted to bring that out shout out to those people who be doing those good things got to give them a hand for that you know what I mean? Um, and that's what we that's what we're here to do, man. We're gonna be talking about the Second World War. All right. For those of you who don't know, because school doesn't teach you shit, you know what I mean? Let me give you the cliff notes, <laughs> right? The Second World War was fought uh, September 39 to September 45. That's 1939, 1945. Um, and it was a world war, right? So it involved Europe. You know what I mean? The Pacific, Atlantic, Indian Ocean, South Indian, uh, Southeast Asia, China, Japan, Middle East, Mediterranean, North Africa, Horn of Africa, Central Africa, Australia, North and uh, South America were all involved. And then, you know, here's some just bullet points. You know what I mean? It was basically Nazi Germany, uh, Imperial Japan, Fascist Italy versus the world. Um, just, to, just to put it to you bluntly, versus the world. And they lost the world one um how do we know that they lost because we're not speaking japanese german or italian right and uh the fact that i'm alive lets you know that we won <laughs> right because uh, what nazis was doing was absolutely horrific so with all that said let's bring on our guest today brother franco what's up man hey, hey what's going on uncle dl what are you saying i'm um, all right man let me give you let me give you a hand that you deserve man we got Brother Mike is in the house. What's good? What's good? We see fresh and fit coming through. Thanks for the support, go. brother Michael. Um, so yeah, man. Um, you and I, you know, we kind of met through that world, the uh, the fresh and fit world. Um, yes, in their very, Patreon, very. and and uh, so before we get started, before you tell the world who you are, um, tell me briefly, man, what brought you to the manosphere in the first place, man? How did I mean? How did how did you wind up Ooh. in a, in a position where we could meet? <laughs> And I'm not looking for your I'm not looking for your red pill moment. I'm just wondering, like in know, general, what brought you? Uh, well, not, like I guess I have to bring my red pill moment. I, there's the only way to tell this story. <laughs> well, All right, well, well, I tell you what. I tell you what. Start with your red pill moment, and then roll into who you are and what you're doing with this pot with your platform. So there you go. We will make it easy. All right, I'll try to make it short as possible. Well, I'm a uh, cancer survivor of state. I've survived uh, stage four uh, squamous cell carcinoma. As you can see, this beauty of a scar over here. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go into the further details of my situation, though. But now, long story short, I was divorced a couple years ago. Really didn't know about female nature at the time. Like, really, really 300% blue pill, especially when it comes towards female nature and intergender dynamics. And that's why I started the uh, self-help move, self-help help movement to. What's oh, that? No, excuse me, not self 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 help uh phase and which kind of led me to uh fresh and fit uh december 2020 that's when uh myron blew up on tiktok uh punishing bad behavior <laughs> following by um why men and girls uh, men and women can't be platonic friends all right fast forward to uh i guess uh six months ago uh or i guess a year ago maybe six months oh okay we'll say six months uh deal kind of popped into the telegram chat uh we kind of you know shoot the shit for a little bit and next thing you know we we uh start talking about military stuff and come to find out that hey you're a vet and i'm a vet <laughs> well 
I was I served in the uh, Canadian Forces uh, Primary Reserves. I uh, did it for five years, and he kind of told me his military history, and we just we, and we clicked. That's what's up, man. So this is for you, man, for everything you've done. Surviving cancer is no easy task, bro. Surviving a, uh, a breakup or divorce is probably even harder in my book, yeah. man. You came out on top. You're still pushing forward. Shout out to you. I didn't know that. You see, this is why these platforms are so <laughs> great, man. This is and this is this well, is the that. no, we never we never touched on that, bro. No. And uh, this is the essence of why I wanted to do this this platform. You know what I mean? Hence the title. DL saying, I really want to know. You know really what I mean? And that's, know. I really want to know. So <laughs> and dealing with I mean, and dealing with that, bro. And uh, you know, shout out to you. Uh brother Jason's in the house. What's good, brother? Bro's oh, good. Oh. You know, you got Going fire on. in there for us, and brother Mike is in there, like, fire, yeah, you know what I mean. Fire. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, Brother Mike's always big time, big time supporter of Fresh and Fit. Um, I've seen him just going through the archives. He's been in there. It seems like day one with uh, with Myron and Fresh and what they got going on over there. So, so uh, you know, shout out to you, brother. And uh, Brother Jason is into um, credit repair and then, and then right. just basic credit uh, knowledge. We did an episode a few days back. We're going to do a follow up episode because we ran out of time pretty much. And uh, really delve into it. The brother knows what he's talking about um, on that credit finesse game. And all we got to do is look at someone like Fresh. <laughs> he's using his credit and he's doing everything to um, to level himself up. And with him, it's with the with the cars, with the jewelry, with the lifestyle. Um, he put in the work and he's using that to build his brand, to build his business. And shout out to him, man. It is absolutely working for him. That dude is always working. Well, speaking oh, of uh, Myron Fresh, uh, they actually inspired me to do this, to do this podcast on my own. No kidding. Like, what when they uh, did the whole like sound effects, like, well, I'm like, I wish I had my uh, sound effects like fixed up. So, uh, do you have the uh, the take the uh, the Dream World uh, sound by any chance? Oh, you want to? Well, I have my own version. I got story time. You about to tell a story? Yeah, I got story time. Right, story time. Story time, baby. All right, here we go. One second. <laughs> I get. We we'll get you going with story time, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh what was uh, we were watching like f like fresh and fit how like Mario likes to do his uh soundboards and i always wanted to do like a podcast like something similar to that and i was like one day like scrolling through my phone which i should be doing other better like doing better stuff like i don't know, do something productive though but i guess it, it kind of kind of a good thing to happen because i scrolled through this video on instagram like you know how like um you can transfer TikTok videos on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was watching that, and uh, this guy was doing a survey. I guess in uh, I don't know, somewhere in California, where he's asking the, does anyone know Gen Z kids about the Holocaust? You know what it is, dude. Well, some of these kids, I don't know if it's like staged or if they're trying to make like I don't know. It it, it looked pretty real, dude. Like they didn't even know what the hell the Holocaust is, and the last person they interviewed. Uh, this fat obese uh, person. I'm not gonna say which color or which race, whatever. That's irrelevant. But what's relevance is her reaction. You know what she said? Is that a California thing? Hey, and I'm looking. I'm like, are you kidding me, man? Like, what the yeah. hell has this generation gotten into? And then it's like they're too busy watching dumb shit on TikTok for like 15 seconds, like just watching endless bullshit. Like, what if I can do a podcast that's just like, does like, like, does like a very short stories on, and then it hit me. I was like, maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can do some episodes, right? Bring them into shorts, do some, in, like, funnel people, like, through my Instagram, make some shorts, do some, like, some stories. Boom. Maybe, hopefully, they'll, like, flow through the algorithm within all the bullshit, if that makes sense. I mean, it does make sense, man. And it's, you know, here's the thing. And it's not just Gen Z. It's not just the millennials, man. It's Gen X. Americans are stupid. <laughs> Most Americans, bro, they, they can't Canadian name three know. countries. I'm just, but I mean, I can speak on America, man. I've, I've never been to Canada, although I've, I've spent quite a bit of time no, around Canadians. We just have snow. <laughs> right. Well, America has snow, too. Like, I'm, I'm from the Midwest, man. So, but, and here's the thing. Fair enough. America doesn't play that we don't place any value in knowledge in education when you can go through America and find people who can't name three countries on planet Earth three three I mean dude at least name your country there's only two at least you got one 
<laughs> right. And they struggle to name three countries, bro. That that was not staged, man. Like, it, but if you ask them what the Kardashians are up to, you know, no. what I mean, if you ask them about the real yeah, house, oh, housewives, that, up, oh, absolutely. That <laughs> Absolutely, man. So, I mean, and it's just one of those things, man. So, salute to you, bro. I hope it works out. You know what I mean? I hope people will come and, and oh. want to learn, or at least they have an act. You're putting it out there. The content's there. So, I would say if they get a test on World War II, they can come and watch or a test on something. But here's the thing. They don't teach this stuff in school anymore, bro. You know, I have a teenage daughter, man. They're not learning anything in school. That's They're but not learning anything. What are they learning exactly? Uh, they're learning about pronouns. Uh, they're learning how to be gender fluid. They're learning how to paint their hair purple and pink and green, right? You know, uh, it's funny that you said that because I'm sorry, I was stop for there for a second. I, I I was doing this uh, job last week in elementary school, doing an elementary school renovations. Uh, in case you guys want to know what I do full time, I am a mechanical insulator. I work in the trades, and so I there's some like some bulletin boards still there for the kids, and I I rent this one bulletin board where they have like three different types of transgenderism three different flags and i'm like what the hell it's like there's regular transgenderism there's i don't know like native transgenderism and by tra I, I don't know dude like I, I can't keep up man it's like right. what the hell are they teaching these kids like whatever happened to like you know like we're all human race there's one race human race like a bunch of like kids from different colors holding hands but whatever happened to that shit man Man, damn if I know, bro. I spent three or four days trying to uh, explain to my daughter that she's a female of the species because she didn't want to acknowledge the fact that she was a girl. She <laughs> didn't want to acknowledge the fact that they were boys. She was like, I don't know, maybe I can just be a piece of cheese. It's like, no, you can't. And that was a very, dude, it was a real <laughs> serious conversation I had to have with my child because, and I asked her, like, where, well, you know, where did you learn this? Again, I wasn't being accusatory. I wasn't screaming at her. I'm just, we're just having a conversation. I'm like, oh, so, you know, where did you learn this? I mean, you didn't learn this here. Did your mom tell you? No, my mom didn't tell you. What, what was the people at school? And then here's the thing. On some level, the children, they understand that it's bullshit. They do because they are reluctant to tell a parent. They know fundamentally something ain't right with what they're being taught. They know something is, is different in the schools versus being at home. The children understand this. At least in America, they do. My daughter really understood this. But, you know, uh, we have an open dialogue always. I'm dad. I discipline. But, you know, I still need my daughter to be able to talk to me so we can sort this out before it becomes an issue. So, bro, they, lo they know that, but they can't tell you who fought in the American Civil War. And this is where we come in. And this is where we come in. So we're going right to so talk about uh, World War II. For, for those who are in the chat, yo, we, we dropped uh, we dropped the Foxtrot Sarah podcast link in the chat. Please go over there. Check it out. Give him a subscribe. Like He's brand new, getting going. Uh, show some support, show some love, check out what he's doing, give him some feedback so he can get better. It's in the chat, so do us a favor and do that. So Appreciate it. Hey, just, yeah, absolutely, bro, absolutely. So let's talk about World War II, man. Where did you want to begin? All right, well, let's kind of begin, uh, hmm. Well, since we're kind of covering the whole thing, it's a good thing I got my uh, notes here from all, yeah. all my previous episodes. Uh, and, 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 let me, and let me clear it up, because we're going to talk about why it was so easy uh, in the early stages for Germany with respect to France, uh, like the thumbnail said, um, you know, we, we, we're we already 15 minutes in. So for us to cover all of it in 45 minutes would be, uh, yeah, um, we, boy, you know okay. what I mean? Just, okay. You know well, what I mean? I'll, yeah, okay. Well, okay. Germany invades Poland in 1939, right? After they expanded, they annex Austria, they annex uh, Czechoslovakia. If you want to, like, go take explicit details, uh, watch my episode, uh, The Nazi Aggression. It will give you explicit details on it, followed by uh, Rise of the Third Reich. Now, when they were doing this, France and Great Britain just kind of stood by, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, what happened was, like, uh, when when Germany invaded Poland, like, they, they were so afraid of starting a world war, they really, really did not want to antagonize the Germans enough as is. And they're, it, it's like an inevitability. It's going to happen one way or another, right? And so, like... There was this uh, phase in, during the war called the phony war, which is like they pretty much like went on the uh, defensive. Actually, hold on. We will. Uh, I got it. See, we got this uh, notes here from. Uh, OK, on the 9th of, 9th of September, 1939, actually, the French did make a, a bit of an, an offensive into Germany while they invaded Poland. Did you know that? 
No, I did. I did not know that part. Now explain. Okay. Well, they uh, they attacked the uh, the Saar region, uh, which is like this uh, area in Germany where they had to give up uh, during the uh, in accordance with the Treaty of Versailles after the First World War, and so that's when uh, France decided to uh, invade that territory. Though, though, but they marched into five miles, uh, five miles into Germany, into the Saar region, and guess what happens, DL? They were ordered to not only stop, but to withdraw back to the Maginot Line. So they began to uh, uphold the treaty of Versailles, as they should have. They were bound by treaty. Mm -hmm. Germany was doing their thing. France was like, okay, and they were stopped and told to return. That, well, actually, well, actually well, let, let me re-explain that stuff. So, uh, during the Treaty of Versailles, they, Germany had to uh, give up the Rhineland along uh, uh, two, two, two regions that's mineral rich. Uh, the, Ruhr, the Ruhr region, R-U-H-R, and the Saar region. When the Nazis took back, uh, when they start building their armies, when they were trying to challenge the Treaty of Versailles, when Hitler took power, uh, he took back the Rhineland along with the Ruhr region and the Saar region, and that's when France and Britain kind of stood by and didn't do anything. Thinking, okay, we kind of kicked their asses in the tree a little bit. We we're kind of unfair. Let them have the territory back, and this thing will blow over. Though, so, but they kept pushing, as you can see in history. It was all about appeasement, and this is when like American politicians to this day love to use that word appeasement, appease, appease, appease. But they mm -hmm. really don't know uh, what part of history we're talking about here, and that had everything to do with Neville Chamberlain and his relationship yep. with Adolf Hitler and his unwillingness to stand up against the Nazi aggression in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely correct. Okay, and, and then, so who was who was his, who was the French counterpart? Like, who was the French prime minister at the time, or did they even play a role in this to this point? I uh, know, they they did. Uh, okay, um, again, same thing. Uh, I got his name right here. So my notes are kind of everywhere, for Christ. Uh... Because a lot of people, when we get to this part, of, when it, this part of history, they're like, "Oh, during the war, it was Charles de Gaulle." Like, no, de Gaulle was a general. No, no, de Gaulle did his part. De Gaulle, okay, Paul Renard, that's his that's name. It. Okay, Prime Minister Paul Renard, like him and Chamberlain, they, they're kind of like you know they kind of want to play on the uh, defensive because again, they really don't want to antagonize the Germans, and so also the reason why because they heavily relied on the Maginot Line, which I can kind of pull up here. Uh, just give me a moment here while I get everything set up. All right, here we go. And a lot of people don't realize realize this about World War II and these generals. Most of the generals were aristocrats. They had the highest education money could buy. But all these guys were so arrogant. These politicians were arrogant. You had a few exceptions. One of those exceptions was Winston Churchill. Right? He was an aristocrat and he was all that. But what he was not was uh, mm -hmm. afraid to face Herr Hitler, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> and we'll get, I mean, we'll get into that probably towards the end of this broadcast, but Neville Chamberlain, who simply didn't want to send and commit young British men, young men from the empire to go and die in a senseless war, having been around for World War I, he simply did not want to commit. And this is what allowed Hitler to do what he was doing. Um, and, and it's like, dude, this is what we talk about with bullies. Hitler was pushing the boundaries, man. When someone does steps up and they want to quote unquote bully you, you don't deal with that by going to talk to other people and saying, hey, let's go over and use our words. Now you punch them in their mouth immediately. Mm -hmm. And they're going to sit back and be like, all right, let me go bully somebody else because that guy right there is going to fight. So yep. here we go. What, what did you just load up? All right, uh, this is the uh, the outlayer of the Maginot Line. Uh, right here, this is I'm going to cover this on uh, next Tuesday's episode, uh, Fall of France. That will be my, my episode 15, though, but here's a little teaser. Uh, the Maginot Line, if you guys would read it by now. Uh, I'm just going to give like a quick rundown on it. Uh, these were from like built lessons from the First World War. This is like the state-of-the-art military engineering out there during its time. The original idea is they really want to uh, do it from the Belgian coast of Ypres all the way down to the Italian coast. So, but there was some political controversy because not only the Belgians are intimidated, but so are the Swiss. And the Swiss are like, 
dude, really? Are you kidding me? And the French are like, yeah, okay, maybe we should like just throw it along the Franco-German border. And yeah, so they have relied on that, plus the Ardan Forest, which they believe that it is too thick to drive tanks through. Yeah, impenetrable. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've, I fought in the war when they were saying stuff like that. Well, you know, that's a natural barrier. There's this big desert. There's no way that you can get a, a army full of tanks through that desert. Uh, and this was uh, Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard and Saddam Hussein's army. Like, so we don't have to worry about that desert. And guess what we did as the Americans? We drove our tanks right through yeah. that desert and we lit their ass up. <laughs> America. America. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> America. So we got a uh, we got a wonderful 34 in the house. What's good, brother? Welcome. Thanks for coming through. Appreciate the support. We're here with the Fox Trot Sierra podcast, man. We're getting, in, we're getting into the weeds with some World War II. And and uh, so, all right, so the Maginot Line. Like, I've heard of Maginot Line. I understand um, how that um, that fortification was supposed to deter any sort of attack. Um, mm-hmm. But I also know I also know how uh, effective it was. So, so continue then. So we see what the Maginot Line was all about. Um and so France wasn't really concerned about Germany pushing into their country because of this. Be- and, uh, you know, I, I think the, at the time, France had more armor than Germany did. Yes, they did. They outnumbered them. Uh, they had a much, uh, oh, stop sharing this. Uh, they had a much better equipped, much better trained army than uh, Germany. And, yeah, uh, of course, like this national line that I showed you, uh, it's supposed to uh, hold the offensive for, uh, sorry, hold, hold offensive for only 20 days until they can actually get the bulk of the French army to go on the offensive. That's the whole general idea of having this national line. Wow. And and that was the plan. Like, OK, this is a great plan. It's one of those things. Looks good on paper. Yep. This is this is great. And then keep in mind, you got these generals. We're brilliant. No one can tell us anything. So we don't have to worry about Germany. So you got the French who are supremely confident, maybe overconfident. Mm -hmm. And you have Great Britain who's in the prime minister who simply doesn't want to commit to a war. Yeah. So they were slowly, they were slowly uh, like, like disembarking like from France. Oh, uh, before uh, the, during the point of war happened, let's not forget the uh, Norwegian and Danish campaign. This is when uh, Germany tried to uh, invade up north to uh, invade uh, well, Denmark because it was in the way. And also they want to use the launch pad to uh, invade Norway because they had the iron that they needed to build more tanks, more rifles, whatever. And so the British, uh, the, the, actually the Allied forces, did uh, dispatch uh, their troops over to Norway, though, but they were taking their time. And that took a uh, advantage for the Luftwaffe, which is the, the German Air Force at the time, to pretty much bomb the living shit out of them. And it kind of turned to a debacle. And they ended up uh, pulling out of Norway because that's when uh, Germany invaded France. And we'll explain how in a minute. All right, because we're going to definitely have to get to that part. And the thing is this, the thing that is funny to me, under the sanctions and under all of the you know rules and reprisals, of the Treaty of Versailles. Mm-hmm. Germany wasn't supposed to have all these, these personnel. They're not supposed to have the standing army. They're certainly not supposed to have the armor. They're certainly not supposed to have the Air Force. But they built all that. They trained their pilots using gliders. They did all this stuff on the low, hush hush. Mm-hmm. Right. Meanwhile, you got France and Germ you got France and Great Britain watching. And there are people in you know, within the, the apparatus in Great Britain, like, yo, they're building up an army. No, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. Don't say that. <laughs> uh, according to uh, Nicholas uh, Zetterling and his book uh, Blitzkrieg, uh, what uh, t- the first uh, Panzer tanks, the Panzer One and Panzer II, uh, they actually uh, they actually made a deal with the Soviets during the time to uh, test their tanks in, but in the skies as quote unquote agricultural tractors smart yeah right they got away with it they knew what they were doing um and that's the thing about politics guys there are people out there like they just want to plug their ears close their eyes and scream no 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 because they just don't want to deal with the truth right these are the people who will fight to stay ignorant blue pill 
Yeah. Right. The, the red pill guys, the red pill women and men are those people who are like, yo, man, those are not tractors. Those are tanks. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yo, man, they got all these. Why do you need 8000 pilots? Why you got all these guys in gliders, man? They got airplanes somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Like, why are you marching on these, you know, these countries that are filled just full of these natural resources that you need to build up an army? And the red pill people are screaming. The thing about being unplugged is eventually those people who are trying to deny it, they come to the fact that, you know what, uh, you know, there's some truth there. <laughs> right. So and then Brother Mike was saying communism looks great on paper. Yeah, I was reading that. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Sure does. Looks great on paper. How did that work out for the people behind the Iron Curtain? So, all right, so let's get into it, man, because we're coming up on uh, almost a halfway mark, man. Let's let's actually get into the invasion of France, and I'm sure it's going to have a lot to do with the Maginot Line. It's going to have a lot to do with a whole mm-hmm. bunch of other stuff. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's kind of start when. Um, okay, there was this uh, general named uh, Eric uh, von Manstein. Okay, actually, originally, originally the, the German plan was the, um, if you look at my, my first episode, uh, I'm sorry, second episode, uh, the Schlieffen plan, uh, during the First World War, the Germans kind of went a button hook uh, through Belgium. Again, like nothing to do with the Netherlands, because the Netherlands was neutral uh, during the First World War, so they, that, that's, that's why they want to invade Belgium. Button hook around Paris, uh, enough to like just eliminate the, uh, the, the Allied army. And then concentrate their uh, forces east towards the uh, the Russians. That was the plan. And fast forward to uh, 1930, 1940, uh, uh, German conser- conservative generals really like wanted to repeat that plan again, but include the Netherlands this time. And though uh, this is this plan was designed to fail because these ger- these German generals don't want another war with France because. Dude, they, they tried for freaking years trying to defend France with a much bigger, much tra- better trained army, and they lost. Yes. So they're, they're like, well, we can't have this freaking war. So, but there we, there we go. Uh, this guy named uh, Eric von Manstein, uh, sorry, Field Marshal Eric von Manstein, he kind of devised a plan to uh, use speed and aggression through the Ardennes. And Which so, was a crazy plan. All the generals thought, like, he must be out of his yeah, mind. Yeah, like, shot him the fuck up. And there and was only, I, there was one person who was interested in this plan. I wonder who it was. Yep, the Führer himself. And then he took another opportunity behind the conservative general's back, and Hitler was persuaded. He's like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it. And so guess who uh, spearheaded the uh, the Blitzkrieg? Well, let, let's, uh, hang on. Which and a lot of people like when you, know, you gotta understand like whenever there's a war, generals are always fighting the previous war. Mm-hmm. They never take a war on and say, "Well, this is different. We need to come up with a new way yeah, of doing yeah, things." Yep, yeah, there you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. And anyway, so uh, spearheading this uh, Blitzkrieg, which I got the notes over here. Uh, like, what is Blitzkrieg? Uh, lightning war is what it means. Uh, it emphasizes speed through motorization of forces, concentration of attacks, and up-to-the-minute communications between units. And so, in order to spearhead this, is this uh, guy named uh, uh, no, I always say uh, Hans Guderian. That, that was the man who kind of spearheaded th- to the, uh, the Ardennes. And we'll explain that in a minute. But first... They they decided to uh, initiate the uh, Schlieffen like plan and invaded Holland, uh, correction, the Netherlands and Belgium. And so first they uh, parachuted uh, uh, troops down to Rotterdam area. And so the Dutch are trying to react because they haven't fought a war since 18... Uh, I'm trying to remember. I should have wrote this down. 1860 something. Like in, in European soil. And they've been neutral throughout the First World War. And they're like, holy shit. Nazis aren't being out of nowhere. We got to do something. So they did try to uh, pull back to, uh, I guess, uh, some uh, river causeway area to hold the line. Though, but those paratroopers kind of fucked up their plan already, and that's how the Netherlands uh, pretty much fell. And there we have Belgium trying to hold on, and then once again, repeat of the First World War, getting getting that aspect. 
And while, and, and, well, and, oh, I'm sorry, uh, well, sorry before I finish, uh, while they're invading, the Allies actually uh, thinking, all right, we, we, we planned this before, we can do this again. All right, concentrate their forces right into the Belgian area. So, but guess what happens? There is, uh, there is Guderian driving his fucking Panzer troops right through the Ardennes, bypassing the Maginot Line, right behind the troops somewhat. And I actually got a map right here. If I can pull it up here. And then, the, and here's the one thing you need to realize, you guys who are, who are listening to this. It wasn't until this point that Great Britain and France were like, okay, that Germany is being bad. We need to declare war, which shocks Hitler. Hitler mm -hmm. didn't believe that, that Great Britain and France would actually declare war. He was kind of shocked by this whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I for, sorry, for, sorry, folks, forgot to mention that. Um, yeah, uh, he was like, he, he really didn't take the British and the French seriously, right? So when he invaded Poland, it's like Poland has nothing to do with Britain, has nothing to do with France, whatever. I'm more concerned about the Russians, and so that's why they signed the uh, Ribbon, uh, Ribbon Trump Molotov Pact, of course, the non aggression pact, and this pretty much shocked the living f out of the world. So I should like ease up my swearing. <laughs> But, yeah, but, this, but this is important to throw out there. The political aspect of this is major. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because now you have, like we said, you got the prime minister of Great Britain telling people, I have this piece of paper that's, that's going to secure freedom in our time, peace oh, in our time. Oh, at the time. Munich conference. At the Munich conference, he's convinced that Hitler's not going to do anything. Meanwhile, there was a growing contingent of people within Great Britain. It was like, this man is out of his mind. Hitler is clearly ready to attack, clearly going to attack and take Europe. We need to do something. And it took it took that. It took Hitler sending his paratroopers in. By the way, the reason American airborne soldiers and air, airborne forces are such an integral part of our military is because of how good uh, Germany's airborne forces were. Right. Same thing with their armor. I mean, look at our helmets. You look at our helmets. Like when I served, the helmet, our helmets are look just like the German helmets. From World War Two, it was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot going on. There are a lot of weapons that came out of that war from Germany that are still effective today. Oh, the, uh, the German machine gun, for one, that MG hey, ain't no trick, no joke. You know, funny thing is, if you look at the Chilean army today, uh, they're actually dressed like World War Two German soldiers. That's that's crazy. And but I mean, I, you know, those are some real Hugo, those Hugo Boss uniforms, man. I ain't gonna lie, oh, yeah. they were hot. They were hot. <laughs> Miss AK lady, Miss AKA ladies in the house, welcome, love, good to see you. Thanks for coming through. Hey, Viking hey. paradigms and Viking house, Viking was good. I like, I like that. Yeah, it was good, brother Viking and and brother Viking saying, yeah, he was shocked because they had been supporting him on the on the download, exactly. And yeah. you had that. They were a, there was a lot of Nazi supporters throughout the world in the U.S. Especially, a lot of people don't like talking about this, but the ambassador of the U.S. that was in Britain mm -hmm. was Kennedy and Joseph Kennedy. Oh yeah, Joseph P. Kennedy. Uh, uh. I just have a brain fart right now. The president's... Uh, yeah, that's uh, the JFK, father. Of, JFK, JFK's uh, father. There we go. There we go. Sorry. Yep. He, he was... Yeah, no problem. And he... People don't like bringing this up because their family name is so synonymous with America. He was lightweight, a Nazi supporter. Right? And it, and it was because of... They had to get rid of him. They had to bring him back to the U.S. because the, all the way up until this point, he was trying to sabotage um, the efforts... To stand up against Germany. So a lot of people don't realize this, man. Politics and the the elites and all this, this war was a war that the 1% would fight. And I think it's the last time that the 1% has fought a war. You know, ever since then it's been us peons, the brokies have been fighting. But this is this is a time when the 1% was sending their children to go to go fight. And uh and Kennedy, his sons went off and fought. They fought the Germans, he lost a son uh, in a, an experimental accident. Uh, in Germany, as a matter of fact, his oldest son was killed in an accident flying a, uh, a modified B-17. Um, was there early attempts at radio control flight? He couldn't make it out the aircraft. He died. You know what I mean? And then we all know the, we know the story of Robert Kennedy in the Pacific, you know, PT-109. Um, and then, you know, we know what happened to his youngest brother, uh, who, was, who was also who was, gave his life for his country just trying to be president. So, um, but yeah, I just wanted to throw that in real quick. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, damn. Oh, uh, 
get this okay the invasion of the uh, neutral countries um not only um the netherlands and belgium was invaded but iceland was also invaded by britain oh didn't see that did you Nah, people want excuses to do stuff, man. Whenever <laughs> there's an opportunity to make a move, that's when you do it. There, there was a strategic reason behind that because, like, well, because they, the Allies trying to, like, you know, convince uh, the Icelandic government, you know, side with us, side with us. And the Icelandic was like, no, we, want, we don't want anything to do with this. And though, uh, but Britain send their Royal Marines anyway, saying, you know what, screw you, we're just going to come in there anyway. You guys will have military, whatever. And so on May 10th, they invaded right there. And they start establishing a destroyer and a scout base, uh, sorry, a scout plane base to help Atlantic shipping convoys uh, against uh, German U-boats. All right, this uh, map I have right in front of you, folks. Uh, this is pretty much the uh, the, the down low on how everything went down. All right, so you have Army Group B, Army Group A, and Army Group C. All right, so um, so Army... we're talking about Army Groups A, B, and C. Yeah, obviously we're talking about German. Yes. Forces. Yes. All correct. right. And so the uh, the plan, the new plan is okay. Uh, we're gonna call the Allies bluff by uh, initiating this Schlieffen Light plan. Army Group B is going to uh, invade Belgium. Of course, they they swooped down through uh, Southern Holland after they were defeated. But what they didn't know, uh, I say, well, question. Well, uh, Army Group C is keeping the Maginot Line occupied. You know, kind of keep them busy. And here comes Army Group A, uh, kind of spearheading this thing. Um, uh, I said I said his name again, uh, Guderian. And oh, uh, Erwin Rommel had a part of this invasion as well. And so Army Group A rushes through the Ardennes, and then this is where the Allies had like, you know, like their their, their most thinnest of defenses, like skeleton defense. And they just plowed right through the Ardennes. Uh, first border town was uh, Sedan. Uh, normally in the First World War, they took them years to take it. Uh, they kind of predict, uh, the, the French army today kind of predict it was going to take them uh, weeks. But it took them days, dude. Like three days. Three days, three nights, Sedan was taken. Yeah, you can do that when you're mobile and you're ready and you're motivated. Yep. And then, oh. so this faint, so everyone's really worried about what Army Group C was going to do. Army mm -hmm. Group B makes this this move, which yep. they, which the the allies, the allies being Great Britain and France, were anticipating this move. So they yep. they moved their forces there as anticipated, leaving the Ardennes wide open for Army Group A and uh, with these this brand new blitzkrieg tactic to yep. do what they got to do and make it happen. Miss AKA Lady, not the Kennedys being Nazi supporters, absolutely, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, um, and then with, with that, you said within six days, they were doing things that, that took years to, to do during the first world war. What was the next step? All right. Uh, so therefore the next step is to split the forces, uh, the main French forces from the British French forces and which they reluctantly succeeded. Uh, how they succeeded is, um, when, uh, Guderian, uh, was ordered from was ordered to uh, stop his Panzer troop, sorry, his Panzer divisions, in order for the infantry to like tr for them to keep up because they were like hogging their asses, uh, beating the crap out of the French. So wait for them to keep up. But Guderian can't break the momentum. He's like, no, we got to go, we got to go, we got to do this now. So he kind of said f you to the orders and just drove his Panzer troops like all the way up to the sea. And wow. that kind of, and and that alone really like disoriented the British and the French. They're like, "What the fuck's going on?" Uh, and they're trying to get himself organized. And oh, after um, after uh, the Germans took Sedan, the French tried to make a counteroffensive, though, but they were met with uh, Stuka dive bombers, and they were just bombing the living crap out of them. They really didn't do much damage to the troops, though, but the the uh, the psychological part, like. The whistling bombs, uh, the screaming engines, the explosions, like that would break any person's mind. And especially they, they fought a major war like a couple decades back and they remembered the atrocities, the nightmares of it. And they really didn't want to, and they're reliving that again, like make it stop, make it stop. 
Well, it was that, and it was also uh, the problem with with France and the French army during this this period in history, especially with facing Blitzkrieg, facing the Germans, was a lack of leadership. It was mm -hmm. an absolute lack of leadership. Yes, and I... your key, oh, you said the German key to success was speed communication. Yep, well, and up to the minute communication. Yep, they gotta like be on top of each other, and it was a cooperation between army and air force. Right, working in tandem, hand in glove. Well, they're facing a force, the French army, who had neither speed nor communication. In fact, the commanding general didn't believe in telegrams. He wouldn't use that. He didn't believe in radio, wireless, because he thought that it was compromising his, his orders would get to the Germans instead of his own troops. So they would use pigeons and, and human car uh, couriers to, to, get, to get money, uh, the information back and forth. To find out what the situation is and to send his orders out. So here's the thing. Oh, so speaking of couriers, like, uh, I'm sorry, like, I'm sorry, 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 i am these people trying to get away from the battle, like it, it took them like weeks, months to get like a message across. Because it's like you said before, like this guy like really didn't believe in telecommunication lines, and even the troops did um uh do uh, telecommunication or telephone lines, which they did have. They kept getting cut down by bombers. Yep, you would absolutely. So, but the point being, the reason France failed and Germany succeeded, mm -hmm. and it was so lopsided, was because. The very factors that made Blitzkrieg so effective was the same factors that made uh, the French forces so ineffective. And what I mean by that is they didn't have communication and they didn't have speed on their side. And so they lost. You know what I mean? So and that's and that's crazy. And I see put up a picture of some of the uh, uh, German uh, aircraft from World War II. Yes, they, these, were, these were the Luftwaffe planes like that kind of participated during the, during the campaign. All right. So you have the HE-123A. Uh, uh, if I can read that correctly, yep. Uh, this is like the uh, German, this is like one of their uh, fighters, like the uh, the BF one, the famous Mr. Smith BF one or nine. Is like they were introduced in the battle though, but they weren't even actually mass produced yet until exactly later in 1940 when they attack Britain, thus kicking out the Battle of Britain. Though what that's sent out of the podcast of its own. And, and, and you the, notice, you, you notice, guys, you're looking at the technology, man. They're still using biplane technology at the beginning of World yep. War Two. <laughs> you know what I mean? And by the end of this war, they, we had jets. So think about how fast and how far technology and development went over this four-year span. <laughs> and then, of course, you have your uh, Junkers JU uh, Stukov dive bomber. Uh, these these ones were the screamers. Uh, they, what they will do is they dive deep down, like so down to the point where that's what you have to do. Like you, you, That's the only way to be accurate is you, you do this death-defying dive. Uh, to the point where, like, the air is actually making the engines, like, basically scream. And you can hear that from the ground. Then once you drop that bomb, you got to dive right out. And you can hear that bomb dropping down. And, of course, not only uh, makes a psychological effect, though, but once the bomb hits its target, it does some, you know, some pretty good damage. And, of course, uh, you have the uh, the other the other Mr. Schmidt model. And you have uh, two other bombers. Uh, yes. The BF-110. And the, like the VF-110, that was the uh, another fighter. Uh, it was like a uh, sort of its own version of the uh, the P-38 Lightning. Well, yeah. I think it was it was closer it was closer akin to the Mosquito, the the British Mosquito, which was an all wooden plane, but it was a lethal lethal combat fighter and a night fighter. It looked a lot like this, whereas the uh, the Lightning had that that major cross tail in the back. Yes, and, yes, uh, yes. I'm trying to think back. Yep. And only, I mean, I'm, I'm an aviation guy. I'm a retired air traffic controller, so it was my job to be able to recognize these airplanes. <laughs> you right, know, so this, this, is, this is just your neck of the woods here, brother. Yeah, so, um, but no, still an effective fighter um, until that Messerschmitt, that, that 109 got out there. And it was another fighter that they use um, commonly. It wasn't the 109. Um, it was a lighter single uh, single engine fighter. I cannot think of the name of uh, it. Which one? Uh, the Falk Wolf. The Falker Wolf, yes. Yep. So the the Falker Wilson and one hundred and nine accounted for most of the kills uh, during that during that war, and um, 
that was those pilots were some of the best pilots in the world. Um, and it took it took the Allies a long time to get up to snuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but Great Britain managed to do it. Battle of Britain, uh, which is a, definitely another episode. But um, the the British fighters, and you know, uh, along with the help of radar, were able to to, to and some luck, were able to fight right. off uh, the the Luftwaffe. So, um, man, that's crazy. So, okay, with that particular battle plan, they were able to take France. How long did it take them to take France? Uh, well, the uh... Battle kind of went from. Yeah, I do have like my, my notes here. It actually, took them pretty much like a month to take France. Um, pretty much like the entire month of May, they pretty much took them like it. For whereas like the First World War, they tried four years and failed. Uh, within a month, uh, when they initiated this plan, they they succeeded, even though the Allies. Uh, Allied reconnaissance, especially French reconnaissance planes, and this is where you and I was talking about. You know where I'm going with this. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a major traffic jam uh, b behind the Ardennes forest. Oh, wait, pulling up here. Ah, oh, here we go. Traffic jam. There we go. Oh, I knew you had to pull that out. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can run this article. Like I can explain it though. What I think you can explain this better than I can. Yeah, I mean, it just talks about so when they came up with this battle plan, again, very audacious, very bold. And in war, you know, what I mean, fate tends to favor the bold mm -hmm. and it was working. But this was the one snag that no one encountered. Right. So when they hit the road to Ardennes and this is the German army, it is it kicked off a traffic jam that was 250 kilometers long, Ooh. 250, the entire Wehrmacht was on the flight. That was the German army. The entire German army is on this road to Ardennes. And I'm presuming this is Army Group A. There was a French reconnaissance plane. The Solids reported back to the French general. Said, listen, the entire German army is on this road to Ardennes. Remember what I said about them being arrogant and these you know, aristocratic leaders? Yep. The French general was like, there's no way. General Gablon. General Gamblin yes. was like, Scre nope, nope, that, that can't be true. Uh, actually, technically, uh, some of the generals, uh, some of the, the French commanders did take it seriously, so they tried to dispatch some bombers. Though when Gamblin find out, they're like, what are you doing? No, that's not true. Turn them back. Right. And bomb some other bull bullshit target. So, people, here's the thing. You guys are like, so what's the big thing, bro? What are y'all talking about? World War II would have ended that day. Mm-hmm. It would have been over. They would have wiped out the German army that day. Yep. And uh, what was it? Uh, army group uh, Army Group B would have been annihilated because they were supposed to see the decoy force. Yep, that decoy force was gone. Exactly. World War II would have ended that day. It was a real gamble. And the fact is one, that one man, that French general who knew better. <laughs> Fucking gamble. You know what I mean? <laughs> That just blows every time I think about it. Think about that, y'all. No, no Holocaust, mm. right? No Battle of Britain. None of that. Yep. You know what I mean? No, the, the rush. No Stalingrad. No yep. Leningrad. No, think about that. No death of Jewish people. No, no, six, no Holocaust. No, yes. Million, no six million deaths. Six million deaths. No, no, no political dissidents dying. Gypsies dying. You know, yep. Jews being killed simply because of who they are. No war in North in uh, North Africa. I no won't be alive. Yeah, think, think no, about sorry, it. Sorry, sorry. If the Nazis would have won, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, be, exactly. I wouldn't have been alive. Exactly. So, because my that, grandma was a Ukrainian Kozak, and she was in the concentration camp. Okay. Oh wow. Yep. Yep. Uh, Kozaks were one of the hit lists as well. And who are you pulling yeah. out here? Yeah, like Kozak, and, every, and everyone. Uh, oh, I was just looking at the article itself. It got, it got pretty deep. Uh, it just basically, it? It basically uh, said well, what you were saying. Uh, like, here he is. Uh, th this is uh, the guy who planned it. Uh, Gerald von Manstein. That, this is the guy right here. This yep, that's it. That Eric guy. von Manstein. There he is. The luckiest man in Germany at that time because his plan <laughs> did fail. And all, they, all, all France and Germany had to do was send the bombers, the bombers that were dispatched to blow them up, yep. but got recalled by this, this cocky, confident French general. Uh, uh, Guderian and perhaps Rommel. Rommel. 
would have been dead. Yeah, Rommel, again, it, it, didn't it, Rommel ever would have made it to North Africa. It, the war would have ended that day. Mm-hmm. And this is something that no one, no one taught me about in school. No one at all taught me about this. And that, I mean, it's like, wow, World War II didn't even have to happen. But this is what happened when you're, when you're ignorant, when you're arrogant, when you, when you know everything, the know-it-alls of the world. Mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, all these people had to pay with their lives for his incompetence. Yeah. And this is and this is why people always look at France and say what they say about France. I'm cool with France because without France there'd be no America. Um, but later on without America there'll be no France. So <laughs> I think I think we uh we even that. Uh, <laughs> but um but man that's insane. And and that's the true fact, y'all. That was the worst the worst traffic uh jam in history up until that point. Of course there's far worse now, but um man, the war could have been over right mm-hmm. then. So, All right, um, uh, so yeah, during the uh, the phony war, uh, well, uh, Chamberlain was uh, and prime minister um, of Great Britain. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I got this notes right here about the phony war. Um, yeah, the British and French tried to um, do a do their own uh, naval blockade again as per World War One, so but that couldn't have been uh, that couldn't be done because they had superior submarines, they had the advantage, and they the Allies couldn't stop the blockade so they, they really couldn't do a uh an embargo on them and of course uh there there were there wasn't much uh fighting in the air uh let's let's say uh the only thing that chamberlain did was dispatch bombers to drop leaflets propaganda leaflets because he still wants to try to make peace with Adolf hitler and then after the uh the norwegian campaign failed uh he had to resign and the original guy was not Churchill, but Lord Halifax. They wanted Halifax. Halifax was the favorite. Yeah, no, but Halifax, however, was like, no, you know what? I'd rather have Churchill do it and me as his uh, deputy, his deputy minister. And so they they had that going, and Churchill was both the prime minister and the the, uh, the minister of defense. And however, get this, guys. Uh, Halifax... Was also on uh, Joseph Kennedy's side. They they really wanted to make peace with the Nazis as well, and so therefore, uh, him and Kennedy kind of went behind uh, Churchill's back. And you got it gives you an idea what Churchill was dealing with here. Like he was not only dealing with the Nazis though, but he was dealing with people in his own conservative conservative government. Well, you know, um, Churchill believed in the adage, you know. Keep your uh, friends close, but your enemies closer. He yeah. knew what he Chamberlain and Halifax were up. To, what, what, he knew what they were up to. He placed them on the cabinet. He knew what we, he knew what he had to do. Um, and there's some pretty good movies about that. Uh, shoot, there was one. Um, God, God, I can't remember the name of the actor. Um, very well known actor. Uh, just did uh, not too long ago a movie about this time period with uh, with Winston Churchill. And um, I tell you what, they almost got him. So he's fighting. He's fighting the war on two fronts. He's fighting the war at home, the political war, yep. and he's trying to get after Hitler because he's and, the only one. He's, he's the only one that like didn't want to make peace with Hitler. He's like, fuck these Nazi assholes. Let's kick their asses now. Yeah, and people were real hesitant to follow Churchill because of his reputation in World War One. Yeah, like, he made a lot of mistakes, especially when uh, you guys watch my episode three, uh, Anzac, uh, the Gallipoli campaign. Uh, Churchill tried to uh, send ships through the Darnells in order to uh, make a, in order to send supplies through their czarist imperialist Russian allies. Though, so, but the plan was failed because he really didn't, really, he really didn't predict how how powerful the uh, the coastal cannons are, plus including the uh, the mines that were there, and he was using obsolete battleships, thinking that once again uh, underestimating the enemy. He underestimated the, the Turkish, which failed. Fa- little did he know that once you fight Turkish people in their homeland, they they're, they're hell bent. They're, they they will do anything to get you the fuck out of there. Yeah, to this day the Turks fight like that. They're tenacious oh, yeah. fighters. I know that the Turks had a, a lethal, a very lethal reputation in um, in the Korea War, um, or police action, depending on who you talk to. But no one wants to deal with the Turks to this day. You want them on your side. They are like berserkers. <laughs> you know that, what I mean? That's why NATO kind of signed them on. They're like, 
Yeah, this these are the kind of berserkers that we want on our side. So we'll keep this one close. You know, break glass in case of emergency. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you right now, I've gone on some mission with some Turks, bro. Them dudes are cyborgs. I'm here to tell you, they smoke, they chain smoke, they drink like fish. You and know what I mean? They're probably more in shape than your average 20 year old Westerner. I don't know how they do it, man. Like I said, I've been on missions with those guys. I don't know how they do it. I got a lot of respect for the Turks, and I have a lot of respect for uh, the uh, rock soldiers, uh, Korean rock Marines. Um, you know what I mean? Republic of Korea uh, Marines. Some of the toughest humans I've ever come across. Um, so, yeah, but I'll oh, go ahead. Oh, so I was going to say, did you uh, do something at the DMZ? Yeah, I was I was a DM, yeah, DMZ, yeah, DMZ. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm kidding here, so like I said, I say the word Z, so yeah, forgive me. So yeah, I know it's all good. That's that's how <laughs> we're supposed to say Z, but we're you know it's all about America. Yeah, we say uh, we're know, like, here. Uh, Americans like you guys have like your English is more logical. Let's just say, is it? Yeah, because like uh, for example, uh, the word yeah. color, like I spell C O L O U R. You guys just spell. You guys don't use the U on. It's just color straightforward. Right. That's just because we can't spell. That just kind of happens. <laughs> same thing. With, same thing with tires. It is what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but yeah, man. I got. I've, I've gotten a chance to do that. Like I've served with, you know, the the Scots dragoons. I've been on missions with French foreign legionnaires. Uh, I've been on. You know, I've never. I've never gone on a mission with a Canadian. Um, and Canadian. I've never had that opportunity. But um, you know, a lot of other people. Um, yeah, and I've met some Russian. Soldiers after, you know, as a <laughs> civilian, you know what I mean? Got to drink some vodka and get wild with some cats. Um, so yeah, bro, this this is this is really good. Brother Mike was saying just had a humbling moment, DL. Uh, he was saying uh, makes you very grateful to be alive. Absolutely. Um, we got to study history, people. We need to know where we came from if we have any idea uh, to know where we're going. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I, I, I actually believe in that. So so France failed, mm -hmm. and that brings us to. Just before they fail, that brings us to the evacuation at Dunkirk. Did you want to talk? Uh, we could end off with that. Uh, let's because Dunkirk that's a whole podcast of its own, though. Before we go, you're probably wondering, like, how the hell did the Germans did not sleep during this attack? Well, mm. yeah, <laughs> hang on. Oh, yeah, you know, where I'm going with this, right? Yes, <laughs> oh man, let's just call it Nazis on crack. <laughs> Yeah, the Germans were high as hell, y'all. They were they okay. were on meth they were on methamphetamine. Okay, okay, I'm gonna like power through this. Uh I was supposed to do this on pet episode, but fuck this, I'll do this anyway. All right. Uh okay, so the German officers issued uh pills to their troops to uh help combat fatigue. Uh this is what uh the pill Pertrovin is. So it pretty much is uh crystal meth in pill form. Because uh, it it's sold as a uh pick me up. Uh, so over the counter pick me up uh, medicine in Germany in order to get like a lot of stuff done. The so, little did they know they're they're popping crystal methamphetamine, me me methamphetamine in them. And we we we've all seen crackheads, right? They have this burst of energy out of nowhere. So that's what the uh, the Nazis were doing. Uh, they're issuing not only to the soldiers but to the pilots as well. So that's why you see the Luftwaffe just bombing day and night, bombing day and night. And so yeah. they they perform like pretty much Superman, and therefore I like this. Uh, being a Nazi fanatic plus drugs equals overwhelming force, and this operation would not have been possible if it weren't for this drug. And of course, they they probably had some bad bad withdrawal, like very bad withdrawal. Like there are reports of a Luftwaffe of pilots like getting to accidents trying to land. I guess uh, the drugs are wearing off. They're they're going through withdrawal. And yeah. yeah, sorry, you're when, you good, you're when, you, when you crash off your drugs, man, and you're flying an airplane, that gives crash a whole new meaning. Yeah, and you're right, they were 100% stemmed up. That was the only way they can get through all that. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it was it makes sense because they were moving as, as a guy who, who I've been out there, I've been in the field. It's it's as an infantry guy, you know, like for the infantry oh, guys, keep. Right. So in trying to keep up with, you know, as infantry, you're trying to keep up with armor. They're moving really quick. You got to hump all your gear. You're fighting. You're doing whatever. You know, you get those highs and lows of adrenaline. Yeah. But it, it but it just can't last forever. So you pop in these pills. And yeah, that makes you a super soldier. I mean, that makes you you don't care about the bullets. 
<laughs> you're oh, out there and, just pushing like, forward. Like your, your empathy, your humility, and plus these guys are fanatics, so they didn't give a fuck what they're doing to the enemy. They didn't give a fuck how how badly they've been blowing up, how how much damage they do. They're like, hell yeah, I'm doing this for my country. Hell yeah. Zeke Heil. Bang, bang. Like, doing anything. Yeah, brother Michael saying Fed is going live. Yeah, go over there. Definitely go support Ooh, Myron on yeah, Fed. I'm not sure Myron. what they're doing. Yeah, what yeah. he's doing today. But definitely go over there and support. We're wrapping up here. It was one last thing I wanted to bring up. Oh, uh, Dunkirk? And, uh, no, like we said, we'll talk about, like we said, Dunkirk, that's another episode. Yeah. And for oh, anyone we'll, who wants we'll, to talk we'll, about. We'll, we'll do, we'll do like, a, like a short version of it. Okay, so the Allies pretty much like uh, consolidated in the Sea of Dunkirk. Uh, they try to defend it. And it was pretty much like a miracle uh, combining of bad weather, uh, and a whole bunch of like materials as well. Uh, there was far as like Hitler like holding off the attack as, as per you know, good gesture, hoping that uh, you know, like he's saying, Hey, Churchill, I'm sparing your men, make peace with me. And of course, Churchill's like, Fuck no, I'm not doing this. And so, long story short, uh, they evacuated pretty much the entire well, the entire British expeditionary force and some French troops. Yeah, to the tune of, I want to say, 100, maybe 200 French troops. And here's yep. the thing with that. The way they did it, they didn't have enough landing craft or small craft to help get the soldiers off the beach and to the, to the warships to get them back home. There were no, the Luftwaffe bombed out all of the piers. They couldn't, mm -hmm. there was no way to do it. So they put out an order to all of the British people. And they needed any type of craft that was a certain footage that could get up to the beach. Yep. And the British people responded in such a way that I've never seen since. They they answered the call. And the plan was, we're going to come take your boat, your yacht, whatever you got, and it's going to be manned by sailors. But no, the owners of these ships was like, no, we're going to take it over because yeah, uh, they were I, so committed. I, yeah, I, I forgot his name, though, but he was in the crew of the Titanic. That's all I know. So he brought his son and one of his crewmates, and they were like, hey, you're going to take my boat? I captain it, and I follow my own orders. Fuck off. Not, but it was and it was like that's how committed they were. I mean, you talk about patriotism and they went and they rescued their soldiers off that French beach and brought them home. That right there was just a feat that will always be a, a, a source of pride if you're British, mm. you no matter no matter what. And if you're French, <laughs> you know, what I mean, you're going to be always indebted to those, you know, those Brits across the channel. But um. It, it was just, it was, that was just amazing. And the one final thing, we'll, we'll end on one thing here. Uh, but Brother Michael was saying before they were famous, uh, just did a video on, uh, on Chico. Uh, Chico. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We are trending. Yes, we are. They're, they're making it happen, man. Um, there's a lot going on with the manager. I'm telling you, man, it is mainstream media needs to report on what's going on in the manosphere. They need to talk about the real pill world because that's where the views are. Everyone's talking about it. You know, shout out to Andrew Tate, the Tate brothers. Shout out to Fresh and Fit, Rolo Tomasi, um, uh, Rich, Rich Cooper, everyone else. That's where people are looking. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, it, it, of course, mainstream media is going to come over here. I just saw an article in the Washington, uh, the New York Post about a guy talking about how uh, dating apps are terrible for men. Um, I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the mainstream media about hypergamy and feminism, how that's bad for women and how women um, are too masculine and there's nothing wrong with being feminine. I'm just starting to see it. I'm working on a show about that as we speak. Well, I'm not telling you as we speak because I'm in a show right now. But, <laughs> but the one thing I wanted to bring, I wanted to point out, Bill Burr, one of my, my favorite comedians. Okay. In I his know. last, yeah, in his last special, talked about how the woke, the woke mob wanted to cancel all these men, even dead men, John Wayne and no. Sean Connery, right? They going back even to even Frank Sinatra. Like, come on, Frank Sinatra. They want to go back. They want to cancel these guys, but they don't want to cancel any females. Like, you're not hearing about any females. Like, really, you mean to tell me the women haven't done anything wrong? So, <laughs> Bill Burr brought up Coco Chanel. Coco and every, Chanel. Every American woman and probably every woman in the first world country knows exactly what Coco Chanel, who Coco Chanel is, but more importantly, the brand Coco <laughs> Chanel. It is a, it is synonymous with elegance. You know what I mean? But being regal, being elite, her purses, her her perfume, her her anything with Coco Chanel. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is the and is the thing. And I told I told my people who who was very wealthy and well to do about Coco. They're like, look, we ain't canceling Coco Chanel. Leave. <laughs> she had a Chanel bag on as we're having this conversation. But here's the <laughs> thing about Coco Chanel. She built this company in the 1920s. The brand is still major today. Yep. But there's one thing about Coco Chanel. She was a Nazi sympathizer. Yep. When uh, oh, what's that? when uh when the, when the Nazis uh took France and let's just say on 14th of June, uh she immediately like went in bed. What not not went but like stayed in the same uh, building where the top Nazi uh, officers were and in a started hotel. playing with them. She moved into the hotel where all the top Nazis were. Yeah, and, and then she started and a relationship. Started kissing up, started relationships, sleeping with them, like bro, yeah. like. Like escorting them through balls and galleries, having the time of her life, while the rest of the Parisians are fucking starving. It, yes, and she was she was only out to basically better herself. She had a she had a a, a relationship with she uh, said it was Winston survival. Churchill. Well, of course it was survival, and this is again what is what the red pill word is always preaching what, right? Women, when conquered, have to have the ability to yep. embrace the conqueror it's for their own protection and more importantly for the protection of their children if they have any it's it's it's, it's, it's their uh survival mechanism it is what it's it there's, is and it is what it is there's nothing wrong with it and it's like bill burr said i ain't mad at coco chanel but yeah you know, go watch it, though but like hey if we're gonna cancel someone cancel that nazi sympathizing asshole chanel she was banging a dude, and this is straight from I'm just paraphrasing, but what Bill Burr said was like, oh. yeah, you, you remember when you go you go to the Holocaust Museum, you see that big bin full of little kids' shoes, yeah, right, right there. And she's he's like, Yeah, Coco Chanel was was smashing the dude, banging the dude, licking on the dude that did that. Right? <laughs> oh, oh. But he and, said it in a more uh, vulgar way that when people go right. oh and start laughing because it's so freaking true. Right. And he ends it with so remind me, what did Sean Connery do? <laughs> Brilliant. Or you just got a lot of slap all over a punch. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yes, and her um Winston Churchill, our guest or his people were able to de- like to classify her record as a as a Nazi sympathizer and a spy. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a Nazi courier. And, and it was only it took a while, but it was eventually, I think in the 50s, it was declassified and people, you know, it came out to the uh, to the open what she was doing. And late in life, she was still helping Nazis into the into the, you know, into the 50s, the late 50s, into the 60s. She oh, was still helping Nazis. So, I, I mean, it is what it is. Hey, man, you know, what I mean, she's a team player. You know what I mean? She's a team player. She had to leave France because the French people weren't having it. Oh, buddy, they they, they, they wanted her head. So that's what she retreated to Switzerland. Yes, they wouldn't having it. So, yeah, man, it, it just it just goes to show, <laughs> right? It just goes to show. Wonderful thirty four trader, absolutely. I mean, she was just you know, on, it, it can't get yep. mad at people for being themselves, man. And this is the thing: women will fight you tooth and nail on this. But if the Martians came down and took over planet Earth, they would get rid of all of the men and all of the fighting age boys, and they would take all the women and babies, so they can have little Martian babies and and, and take over. And the women would be like, okay. I guess I'm gonna be smashing this Martian dude. It is what it is. It's a survival mechanism, Miss AKA Lady. By the way, Miss AKA Lady and I are gonna have an episode coming up real soon where we're gonna be debating. Uh, what the, you say? Uh, I mean, hmm? that uh, they want to cancel yesterday's actions with today's standards. A lot of companies were in the Nazis' pockets too. Big freaking facts right there. No, that's real facts. Politics is yeah. You know, war is just extreme politics. But Miss AKA Lady and I are gonna have a discussion. Um, about uh, student loan debt, should it be forgiven by the government or not? The perks and the the, the pros and cons of that. We're going to work out that date. Hopefully within uh, maybe maybe by the end of this week. Hopefully by next week we'll see. But we're going to have this debate. I cannot wait, Miss AK. She gave me a challenge and I have accepted because I'm not <laughs> scared. Accepted. Let's go. <laughs> so it's going down, and I, I am so looking forward to that. I can't wait to have you on, Miss AKA Lady. It's going to be fun. Um, I'm going to hit you up, and then we're going to work out the details. Uh, yeah, one for 34, brother Mike, are both like, oh, my God, I didn't know that. Miss AKA Lady, folks behind, uh, folks go blind when they see a designer level. Yeah, yeah they do. I mean, I ain't going to lie, man. Hugo Boss, man, they made those uniforms for the Nazis, bro. 
<laughs> SS uniforms is hot, man. I ain't gonna lie to you. Look at look at all the, the uniforms from World War II. I'm telling you, Germany had the best. If it was if the war was based on fashion, Germany would have won hands down. Uh, I like this. I like what Miss AK lady says. I would go find me a high value Martian. <laughs> Keeping it real, we one hundred over here. <laughs> yeah, and, get yourself an Andrew Tate Martian, if anyone. <laughs> be over here smashing that, you know, me that green Martian, Martian pink, just making it happen. Like rock me out, baby, rock me on my So all right, yo, Fox Trot Sierra podcast, man, Frank, man, thanks for coming over here, man, and uh, and like oh, enlightening for, us on World War Two. Dude, thanks for having me. Like we gotta do this again. Yeah, we're uh, definitely going to work some stuff out. Of course, you can uh, find me on my YouTube. Just search uh, Fox Rock Sierra Podcast. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at the Fox Rock Sierra Podcast and Reddit. Uh, pretty, much, pretty much the same thing as uh, Instagram that I do. It's uh, uh, Fox Rock Sierra Pod. Uh, type that and yeah. Just give me a follow. Uh, help me with the algorithm. Uh, help me get this information out there. So... People like that individual. When next time, when you say the Holocaust, she better have like a negative reaction towards Nazis instead of <laughs> saying, "Is that a California thing?" Yeah, bro, she's gonna say, "Is that a California thing?" Because you know people are stupid in this country, <laughs> man. But that's like another thing. I did drop the link uh, above. Uh, if you guys want to go over and hit his link, man, go over to the uh, Fox Trust Share podcast. Give it a sub. Show some love. I mean, it's, you know, it doesn't hurt to sub, man. Go over there and uh, and check out what he's, what he's got going on. Uh, thanks to everyone who was here. Brother Mike, you thank you so much. Brother Jason yes, popped brother in. Mike. Wonderful 34. Yeah, Miss AKA Lady in the house. Viking Paradigm. Thanks for coming through, brother. I really appreciate support. I really I do. I just realized you're Fox Rod. Hey there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, let's see. Did I miss anybody? I don't think I did. Thank y'all so much. Um... And then Brother Michael is like, yeah, this was the best. I appreciate that, man. That's yeah. real. You know what I mean? We don't be lying over here. If it's trash, you got to tell us it's trash so we know how to adjust. So I know how to adjust. And if it's fire, yeah. tell me it's fire so I know how to adjust. Miss AKA Lady, oh, wow, I just realized you're Fox Trot. Uh, LOL. Hey there. I'm <laughs> sl- <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is hilarious. <laughs> and Brother Michael went over, subbed, just like appreciate that. It, appreciate that, good. brother. Appreciate hey, that. So like long. Get me up. <laughs> so yo go over there support fox trust here podcast i'm dl saint this is the dl saint i really want to know podcast and uh y'all know what it is i will talk to y'all later and i'm sitting here trying to find my oh here it is all right here we go i'll talk to y'all later peace